Welcome to 50 Shades of Wealth, Confessions of a Real Estate Investor, the show where you'll learn the real estate investing secrets of the pros. Your host, Sarah Jung, pulls back the curtain and shows you how to build wealth with real estate investing. Welcome to 50 Shades of Wealth, Confessions of a Real Estate Investor, the show where we talk about the good, bad, and ugly when it comes to real estate investing and strategies for building long-term wealth through education and personal growth. I'm your host, Sarah Jung, and I'm the CEO and founder of Legacy Bloom Investments. We are a multifamily investment company helping people with passive income opportunities. My hope with this podcast is to help educate and motivate and inspire you to become not only a savvy real estate investor, but also a self-improved and empowered human being so that you can build the financial security that you want and deserve. And today I am super excited to have one of my colleagues on my show, Jacob Ayers, He is a real estate investor who also works a full-time job, and I'm really excited to have him share his story. Jacob's journey started when he graduated from Oklahoma State University with a degree in fire protection and safety engineering. And after college, Jacob moved to Houston, Texas, and dove into the corporate world of terrible coffee, KPIs, and the monotony of a nine-to-five life. Jacob accepted this lifestyle because he truly enjoyed the work. He's always had a knack for building things, both physical and and intangible, and a passion to help people solve problems. Wanting more control over his life, Jacob set up to engineer a lifestyle he had always dreamed of. He bought his first rental property at the young age of 25 years old and quickly after transitioned into buying small multifamily properties. And when Jacob isn't building his real estate empire, he enjoys kayak fishing, exploring new places, and roughhousing with his niece and nephews. Jacob, thank you so much for being on my show today. I really appreciate your time and really want to hear more about how you got started going from Oklahoma State University in safety engineering and then getting into real estate. So tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got started. Yeah, first, thanks so much for having me on the show, Sarah. Congrats to what you're doing here on the podcast. I love it so far. Congrats on the recent launch. So yeah, well, a little bit about me. You know, My name is Jacob, 30 years old now, so I've been investing in real estate for handful of years. My transition from Oklahoma State University, I was born and raised in Oklahoma, grew up there, went to school there. Uh, That degree brought me down to Houston, Texas, where I dove into the corporate world of terrible coffee, as you mentioned. And that was a real saddening experience for myself because I'm an avid coffee drinker. So uh, I knew things had to change right off the bat. (laughs) But no, in all seriousness, no, it's been a great uh, few years. I can't complain about anything. I still work a nine to five and I started investing in real estate shortly after I graduated college. I was just kind of strewn into it. I guess backing up, Sarah, you know, my story is I was kind of born and raised in a lower to middle class upbringing in rural Oklahoma. Like so many people, my parents' best advice and best path for me to escape that world was to go to school, get a good education, get a good day job eventually. And so I did that. That blueprint only took me to about the age of 22, 23 after I graduated college and got that quote unquote good day job, right? So from there, my roadmap had ended. I had no more checkpoints, no more milestones, no more advice on anything to achieve. So I was looking at my next step and I thought, what's next? And the only thing I could see in the horizon was retirement in 40 plus years if I was lucky, right? So (laughs) I just knew I had to do something different. I had this newfound kind of financial income. I had some time on my hands and I had no direction. So I was really interested in personal finance at the time. So I actually became involved in real estate through a podcast. I didn't even know what podcasts were at the time. I was just surfing the web, came across this thing called a podcast. It was one of those right place, right time things. And it just spoke with me. I bought my first rental property six months-ish later and been doing that on the side ever since. It's been a really fun journey. And throughout that whole process, I kind of stumbled across my passion. So that's where I'm at today. So tell me about your first rental property. How did you actually buy it? And was it a single family or, or a multifamily or what? what yeah, it's a fun story. It's a couple, got a couple eyebrow razors in there. So right off the bat, I bought this single family out of state in my home market of Oklahoma. Keep in mind, I was living in Houston, Texas. This was a single family house that I purchased for $25,000. Now, Sarah, oh. I know a lot of your listeners <laughs> are in California and that's probably the cost of 
a mortgage in California, right? So this was an entire property, $25,000, a one bedroom, one bathroom, A-frame style house. It was rent ready and I could rent it for $450 a month, I believe is what it was. So my thought process behind buying this property was as a very low risk, low reward investment. I had learned about this concept from this guy online. And up to this point, it was a real risky proposition. I had a day job. I wasn't sure whether I was going to do this thing for real, this thing being real estate investing. So I went out, I got a traditional mortgage on this $25,000 property, which in itself is a kind of a silly sense. I didn't even know you weren't supposed to be able to do, do that. I know the mortgage underwriter and used thinking like, how did you get a $25,000 mortgage? But I did. <laughs> My mortgage payment on that property is all $141 and some change, essentially your cell phone bill every month, right? So yeah. I figured, hey, if this thing goes south, I can always pay that myself without having any rental income to pay for it. So I bought that property, did the 20% down, $5,000 down, some closing costs, let's call it 7,500 bucks. I was into this property off to the races. I was now a real estate investor. At that point, I received that first rent check and it was kind of my aha moment. It was like my proof of concept. Like, all right, this thing I heard about online on this thing called a podcast six months ago actually does work. And it was a really cool eye-opening experience. And yeah, that was my foray into the real estate investment world. So $25,000, I mean, you know, because me being in the mortgage business as well, I mean, I don't know a lot of lenders that would actually finance that. So you got lucky finding a loan for that amount because a lot of underwriters would be like, what (laughs) What is this? (laughs) Yeah. So that's great. Now, did you, when you came in, was it with your own money or did you use other money or? Yeah, I did that completely on my own. So I saved up the $5,000 plus the closing costs and all that, you know, just with my day job money, put that money down out of my own pocket. And that's how I financed it. Wow, that's great. And at such a young age too. Yeah, you know, it felt like a really big chunk of money at the time. It was a lot of money for me. Looking back, it's kind of funny to, you know, see how nervous I was at pulling the trigger on that deal. And that compared to, you know, the deals I do today, not that they're giant by any stretch of the imagination, but much bigger. Well, you've come a long way. Everything I know about you, you've definitely come a long way. And we'll talk about that. So after that, where did you go from there? Yeah. So I talk about, you know, I had that kind of aha moment, that proof of concept with that very first rent payment from that rent paying tenant. I thought, Hey, this deal is really cool. I'd like to do this deal again, but I want to do it a little bigger now, scale up and get into the multifamily space. So my next investment was a duplex for $55,000. So two doors, essentially double the price. And yeah, that was another really fun deal that I still own to this day. Wow, that's great. So with these smaller multi, like these duplex or kind of fourplex type of properties, or even like these kind of smaller single families, what do you look for when you purchase them? How do you decide what to purchase and how to make those numbers work? Yeah, sure. So going back to my goals that I set early on, I wanted to build up enough cash flow to achieve financial freedom so that I could live life on my own terms. And what that meant for me is, you know, eventually get to a point where I could place my earned income with passive income. And the key to that was through cash flow investment properties, right? So in these markets that I was investing in, Oklahoma, Texas, those are very cash flow friendly markets where I could essentially rent out the property, pay all the expenses, set aside money for maintenance, et cetera, pay the taxes, insurance, and then still have a little bit of money left over that goes in my pocket every month. So instead of taking that money and you know increasing my living cost, I would snowball that into the next property and the next one. And so my Main goal starting out was I was looking for cash flow in these properties. So what was your rules of thumb? Do you have like that we've heard of like the 1% rule and, and things like that. So was that something that you kind of followed as well? Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. That 1% rule. I kind of lived and died by that beginning in, uh, you know, my initial properties. And what that essentially is, if the audience members are unfamiliar with it, the 1% rent to value ratio rule. Essentially, if you have, let's say a $50,000 property, you would expect for it to rent for at least 1% of the purchase price or $500 
per month. So that's it's something I was definitely striving for. And in some cases, I was able to even get closer to that 2%, but that was just because of the markets I was investing in. So yeah, that 1% rule, looking, make sure it cash flows, covers all the expenses. Yeah, those were just some kind of rough uh, rules of thumbs I was looking at. And then when you were looking for properties, were you looking in specific neighborhoods or specific locations or uh, was it just kind of based on how the, the numbers worked out? Yeah, I was looking in places I understood and were familiar with. So, you know, and I moved down to Houston after I graduated college, right? But I chose to invest in my home state of Oklahoma because at the time I knew it better than where I was actually living. And so that's one of the reasons I chose to invest there is because I understood the local markets. I understood what prices were there. I had a bit of infrastructure and more connections in that market. So that's why I chose to invest there. And when you were essentially investing out of state, did you actually go and see the properties or were you you buying these properties sight unseen? I would eventually go and see them, but there are many times where I'd make offers and get through the contract before I ever laid eyes on the property. Now I had, you know, friends and family in the area. So my dad might, you know, drive by and FaceTime me and show me the property and, you know, get a little bit of feel for what it looks like, but you're you know, still like buying a property without ever laying eyes on it until closing day. Right. So, you know, definitely trusting your team. Yeah. Did you ever have any surprises or any like major things that happen like you, you know, after closing or any kind of big repairs or anything that you discovered later? In terms of repairs, nothing specifically comes to mind, but there are always surprises. You know, you get into a property or you realize, hey, this expense is a little higher than you anticipated or this off the wall expense at this property. Um, Yeah. So there's always surprises and you try to build that into your underwriting, you know, and try to underwrite conservatively and underwrite for worst case scenarios and things. So that second duplex I actually bought was completely vacant when I purchased it, which goes totally against my rule of thumb of buy for cash flow because it was cash flowing negative amount, not having any rental income, right? But I was confident that I could go into it and get it rented very quickly. So that was another big risk. So I buy this property, essentially side unseen, and I get to the property, you know, I did all the due diligence, made sure, you know, the property is rentable and looked at the market Yeah. So that was, you know, it was kind of a big, uh, what if kind of question mark for that property. Yeah. I can imagine with some of these properties, especially when you purchase them out of state, you know, and it's good that you have people on the ground, especially your family to go in and check things out. Cause I know out of state purchasing, it definitely provides a lot of challenges. So when you, when you went from residential to kind of these smaller multifamilies, then how did you decide and how did that process go when you decide to go into more bigger multifamily? Yeah. So I talked about wanting to scale up to, you know, achieve financial freedom quicker than, you know, buying a single family house and then another one six months down the line. And one thing that was really holding me up in terms of my timeline was the capital to put towards these deals, right? Because I was just saving up my own money, putting on down payment, keeping the cash flow from the previous property, rolling that into the next one and so on and so on. So it was still a very slow process, but that was one thing that was kind of slowing me up. It was a hurdle, but I knew that I wanted to scale. So, you know, after the duplex to the triplex and so on and so on. So that's always kind of been my MO. You're listening to 50 Shades of Wealth, Confessions of a Real Estate Investor. Want a free guide to behind the scenes secrets of real estate investing? Head on over to LegacyBloom.com and claim your free book today. So with the multifamily and the capital raising, what do you find to be the most challenging when it comes to raising capital? And did you raise capital like from your friends or family or... How did you kind of find what was successful for you? Yeah, you know, raising capital is such a big responsibility. You're taking on somebody else's hard-earned money, putting it next to yours, and you have to be the steward of that investment, right? So there's a lot of limiting beliefs around that. And some I still have to this day, like, you know, why me? Why should anybody invest their money with me? You know, those kinds of thoughts. But Yeah. I think at any point, anyone in their career is going to eventually get to a point where they need to raise capital from other people. You look at very large investors and even they raise capital from other people. So that's always going to be a limiting factor, whether you have $100 or $100 million. You, as a good real estate investor, will eventually run out of your own money to invest in deals. So that's something I encourage everybody to eventually get to is, you know, looking at how to scale and use other people's money, create win-win scenarios for everyone. As far as using other people's money, so with the larger multifamily properties, you know, it's very common for investors to leverage other people's money as well as financing and things like that. 
do you find, I mean, because you started at such a young age and you kind of mentioned the limiting beliefs and, you know, it sounds like maybe you had some concerns about people taking you seriously or just, you know, if you had enough experience kind of when you went out and raised money or you're asking for capital, or was there any kind of script or just kind of something that you would say as far as why multifamily, like how can you scale with multifamily and what would be the reason why to go bigger? I mean, going from smaller multiplexes to these larger apartments, obviously there's there's scalability in that. And so, you know, when you talk to investors about these larger deals, is there anything that you would tell them as far as like, you get, they get bigger returns? Kind of what's the benefits for them? Yeah, sure. This is a concept that I learned early on, you know, investing in that very first single family house and then, you know, going into duplexes, triplexes, smaller multis still, you know, is a commercial underwriter and a mortgage originator yourself, Sarah, you're very familiar with this, but the way multifamily properties are valued is based on their income as opposed to single family houses and small multis, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes. Those are valued more on an, uh, a comparable basis, right, to comparable properties in the local market. So that's kind of always hamstrings your value if you're in single families or small multis. So one of the real benefits of investing in multifamily is the way they're valued. They're valued based on the amount of money they create, essentially, right? So once you realize that and you can increase the value's property just by increasing its net operating income, that was like a big aha moment to me. And a concept that many average people don't get or don't understand right off the bat. Yeah, that's that was actually one of the aha moments that I had as well earlier when I started investing in multifamily as well. It was, you know, I was so used to investing in residential and was so used to the kind of residential world where we look at comparables when getting into multifamily. It's like, oh, value is actually based on your income, your net income. So that was really fascinating to me. And, and that was, you know, one of the reasons that I got into it as well. Jacob, we're going to pivot a little bit here and kind of talk about you a little bit more personally, if you don't mind. So as a newer, kind of younger real estate investor, you know, our show here is about confessions. Is there a confession that you'd like to share with us in your experience or just anything that you'd like to share and how it relates to real estate? Yeah, I love this question for one. It kind of, you know, brings you back down to earth, humbles you a little bit, talking on podcast and having an online presence. People can kind of inflate their own egos. (laughs) So I love this question. A confession I have is half the time, I don't fully understand exactly what I'm doing. I'm always, you know, pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I don't always have all my ducks in a row. I'm a terrible procrastinator. (laughs) So yeah, there's so many confessions I could go on, but if I had to boil it down to one is like, I don't always know what I'm doing. I don't always have all of the information before I'm taking action. So I'm figuring things out. Some people that might sound like, oh, this guy's crazy. And other people are like, yeah, totally get it. You got to keep pushing forward and you'll figure things out as you go. And I feel uncomfortable about it sometimes too. But just knowing that, you know, just take action. You'll learn as you go. And if you don't, then you might never even get started. So that's always been my philosophy. That's a great confession. Thanks for sharing that because, you know, that's hard to admit for a lot of people. I mean, a lot of us, especially when we get started on things, we really kind of are, I think sometimes flying by the seat of our pants, you know, and sometimes we're like, oh my gosh, like, what am I doing? Like, I don't know what I'm doing sometimes. And so you kind of wonder if you're doing the right thing or if you're taking the right action, but if you want to get serious about this and really get into it, I mean, you got to start somewhere. Right. And so I think sometimes just flying by the seat of your pants and just going through that process and learning as you go, as you said, is just sometimes a necessity. And then as you build your experience, then you're able to build more confidence and you have more of a knowledge base to you know scale bigger as you have. And so what, what are your goals now? I mean, so kind of where you're at, I mean, what's your goal in the long term? Or what actually what's your goal is short term, like the next five years? And then where do you see yourself long term? Yeah, you know, I'm a big goal junkie and I have been for four or five years now. And my goal setting strategies and philosophies have changed over the years from the very first, like, you know just do what everybody else does, set New Year's resolutions. Those last all of 45 days, right? Before you've canceled the gym membership and are back to your old ways. So from that to then, you know, I came across Grant Cardone's 10X goal setting system. And I I followed that for, you know, a year or so. And every day I'm writing down, you know, I'll have 10,000 apartments under management by 2040. And the next day I write it down. But then I realized 
well, I haven't done anything the past two weeks to get me to that point other than just write it down every day. And unless they're going to fall out of the sky in the next 20 years, I haven't done anything to get myself to that point. So what I started doing is breaking my goals down into smaller, kind of more manageable tasks. And I came across this concept called 12 week year by Brian Moran. And also Brandon Turner has a journal that kind of follows that same 90 day goal setting process. So I found that I've gained a lot of momentum in my professional and real estate kind of life by doing those kind of 90 day goals. So every 90 days I I reset my goals. I look at where I want to be in one year, five years down the line, reverse engineer those goals. And it gives me something to do every single day. So that instead of just writing, I'm going to have 10,000 apartments under management in 2040. And then watching Netflix for the next 12 hours, you know, I actually do something today towards, you know, just one little bitty step towards that goal. So I've kind of loved that goal setting strategy. So that's great. So taking small steps to get to the larger one, right? Yeah, for sure. So for somebody who's kind of newer in real estate or maybe has an investor or maybe they're just a newer real estate investor, you know, one of the big questions too is just, you know, because when you started out, you had saved your own money. How can one get started if they don't really have a lot of money or with the little, very little money out of pocket? Do you have any recommendations for somebody? Sure. There, there are so many unique and creative ways you can get started investing in real estate. I'm a big proponent of buying a small multifamily. That's either you could do a duplex, triplex, up to a fourplex. And the reason those property types are specific, as you know, Sarah, is because the finance you can get on those types of properties. If you choose to live in that property, you can get a low down payment FHA loan of as little as three and a half percent down. You could live in one unit, rent out the others, rent out your spare bedrooms, possibly live for free or possibly live for free and even make a little bit of money every month. So that's a phenomenal strategy that anybody can go out and do. I'm a big proponent of it for those reasons. I love that concept. We call that house hacking in our industry. Yes. Right? yes. <laughs> that's like, and, and really, you know, I would say that's probably one of the better ideas for somebody that doesn't have a lot of money out of pocket. You can do an FHA loan with three and a half percent down. And uh, essentially, really, you're going to live there for free. You're going to have your tenants pay your mortgage. And it's just a phenomenal concept if you can find the right property to make those numbers work. Absolutely. What would you tell somebody who might be afraid to take the first step? You know, a lot of times, when we're looking to invest in real estate, there's a lot of things that go through our head and we're always wondering if, you know, are we making the right decision? Are we buying the right property? There's so many risk factors. And so a lot of those limiting beliefs can prevent us from taking action. So what would you say to somebody who might be hesitant or has been thinking about it? Yeah, totally understandable. For me, it starts with having a clear vision and your reasons why. I like to think about how I I want my life to be in five, 10, 15 years down the line. And I think about the reasons why, you know, do I want to spend time with family? Do I want to not have to worry about my living expenses? Do I want to be able to travel? You know, people have all kinds of motivating factors as to what will drive them to do something. Once you're clear on those, then you have a reason to get out of bed every morning and go out and, you know, look for deals and line up financing and shop insurance and do all the things you have to do as a real estate investor I mean, I love watching Netflix as much as the next person, but I have these motivating reasons why I have a vision for how I want to live my life. And that gets me out of bed every day and drives me to go do those things. And I know you have the same concept, Sarah. Yeah. Thanks, Jacob, for, for sharing that. And, and we'll ask you a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up here. First of all, how can our listeners reach you? And, and you know, you have a podcast and I was actually honored to be on your podcast a while back. And now I'm honored to have you here on my podcast. So how can we reach you and and tell us about your podcast? Yeah. Well, first off, shout out to you for coming on the podcast. That was a great conversation. One of the more popular episodes on the podcast. The podcast is called The Real Estate Way to Wealth and Freedom. You can find it most likely wherever you're listening to this podcast. You can reach me by going to www.jacobairs.com. From there, you can fill out the contact form, reach out to me, connect with me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, all of those good things. I'm, I'm pretty accessible. So yeah, I love hearing from people. So if anything I've mentioned, resonates with you, you want to learn more or just reach out and say hi, feel free to do that. I love hearing from people. Yeah. And Jacob's got a lot of great content on his podcast sessions as well. So I encourage everyone to check it out. And Jacob, do you have any books that you're reading or do you have any books that you've read this year that you'd recommend to our listeners? Yes, I've had uh, I've had a chance to read some really good books this year. One of them is called The Wealthy Gardener by John Soforic. It's probably a top three all-time book for me that I just came across this year. So phenomenal. 
you know, the other great classics, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I'd be remiss not to mention it, but everyone's probably read it or knows of it. One book that I'd like to mention is called The Seven Money Myths That Are Killing Your Wealth Potential by my good friend, Keith Weinhold. This is a very short read. It's less than 100 pages, very quick read. There's a lot of key principles in there that they dig into, you know, your your assumptions about money, you know, money is the root of all evil. Money doesn't grow on trees. You know, you've got to save money to make money, those kinds of things. So I love that book, The Wealthy Gardener, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all great books. Those are great. So actually some of my favorites as well. Jacob, I really, really enjoy your time today. Of course, I always love chatting with you and it's always great to talk to you and catch up. And so there you have it. So thank you everybody for listening so much at checkout jacobbears.com and uh, check out his podcast as well until next time thank you for listening thanks for listening to 50 shades of wealth confessions of a real estate investor with sarah jung make sure to visit us at legacybloom.com where you can join our investor club and grab a free copy of sarah's latest book and if you like the show don't forget to leave us a quick review be sure to tune in next time as sarah pulls back the curtain once again and shares more confessions of a real estate investor 